Okay, Maddie, we're live. Thank you, Bobby. We are live from Baltimore with Radical Democracy with Maddie Cheers. I'm here visiting my my family home for the holiday. So unfortunately, guys, you won't be able to come to call in, but you will be able to text in if you're listening with any questions. And I am here with my sister, Celia Kibler, who is the founder of Pumped Up Parenting. So we thought since we've been talking about peace in terms of education, that we should talk about it in terms of parenting. We've done two shows on changing our educational system so that it honors children for who they are, so that they can grow up to be happy people, and happy people are peaceful people. So I've invited Celia to join us as we're going through this rather stressful holiday season. That was my producer, Bobby, who was bringing us in remotely, who just went through a stressful ride just to get to the studio to bring us in. So thanks, Bobby, again, and thank you all for listening. So this is where we're going to talk about dealing with your children when they're stressful, when you're feeling stressed, or when you're feeling happy and calm, peaceful parenting, using positivity, patience, perseverance, and play, my personal favorite part. So I'm going to turn it over to my sister, Celia, and Celia, tell us a little bit about how you started all of this. Well, hi, and thank you to Maddie for having me on. I appreciate it, and I think Maddie is doing a fabulous job with her (laughs) podcast. Super proud of her and just uh, really spreading the word um, of peace and uh, women's oneness and everyone working together to get things done. Um, I am Celia Kibler, and I'm the founder of Pumped Up Parenting. I am basically a family empowerment coach. I work with parents, especially those with toddlers, to understand what their kids are thinking, why their kids do what they do, and teach them how to get their kids to cooperate and listen. Pretty much the goals that we all have as parents. And we teach this through a positive and peaceful method as opposed to um, disrupting the family and relying on our emotions and not knowing how to control our emotions and dealing with a lot of anger and fighting and disagreements um, so that you and your kids can basically live a happy childhood, a fun childhood, and really enjoy the growing up that is going on with your kids. I have five kids, uh, two I gave birth to and three I gained through marriage. And I have seven wonderful grandkids. I have over 30 years experience managing kids in a classroom and camp environment and working with their parents as well. Um, And I decided to start on this journey a lot because of these 30 years of witnessing the change in parents and the different trends in parenting. Um, I did raise five wonderful children, if I do say so myself. And if you don't believe me, you can ask my sister. (laughs) But... um, (laughs) They have. They are now running very successful families of their own. They have got wonderful careers. And um, we did that a lot through just having fun and being happy and them knowing that there is unconditional love where I come from. And um, I've always got their back and I'm always there to guide them and coach them and counsel them, but not direct them and demand them. Um, so... We're talking a little bit about what I think are four of the very important aspects of parenting, and that is patience, positivity, perseverance, and play. They happen to be the four P's of parenting. And um, patience is something we all dream of having, and we, <laughs> we can have in all aspects of your life, not just your children, could be your coworkers, could be your family. It's family time now. And the holidays very often bring on stressful times for people when they have to deal with family. Sometimes they have lost family. Sometimes they are just, you know, just are not great social creatures and get stressed out when they have to be around their family for so often. Well, kids get stressed out too. And one of the keys to helping your children during this time is understanding the stress. And patience comes into play when you get good sleep 
your kids get good sleep. And it's vitally important at this time of year because there are crazy schedules, crazy things going on. Parents are in, grandparents are in, relatives are in, and there are parties and there are dinners and kids don't get decent sleep and parents don't get decent sleep. And sleep is key when you're trying to have patience. You know, if you don't get a good rest, a good restful night, you're a little irritable. Well, so are your kids. <laughs> and um, you need to recognize triggers that your kids have. Are they hungry? Are they sleepy? Are they thirsty? Are they overwhelmed? Which is a lot of happens at the holiday time. Are your routines in place? You need to keep your routines in place. And that way, when a child goes out of routine, when there are special holiday things going on, it's easier to get them back into their routine when that event is over. And remember that calm breeds calm. Just like chaos breeds chaos, calm breeds calm. And you really need to stay as calm as you can during this time so that your children stay calm. You need to tune into their needs. You need to tune into their interests. You really, like Maddie and I were talking today, you need to be aware of what makes your children tick and what they like and not force them in the direction of something that you believe should be happening and more recognize what they have a passion for and a need for and a want for. And if you tune into your kids, you can discover that at the youngest of ages by just watching them. And it's also really important for you to to not feel guilty. We talked a little bit about this last week when we were talking with uh, Morgan Jamie Dunbar about her very sad experience. And now that she's a parent, is there, there's a lot of guilt laid on parents now. There's a lot of super parenting ideas out there. So at the same time, if you can pull it off, you don't want to berate yourself. We all make mistakes the same way we don't want to berate our children and when they're in a situation where they've made a mistake, we don't want to bring it back to ourselves either. And that's a lot of remaining calm in a difficult, stressful situation is to kind of give yourself a break. You know, forgiveness works all over the place. Forgiveness works for yourself and it works with your kids. And we all know that a family is not quite a democracy and actually it shouldn't be, but we certainly can use some tools that help our kids settle any kind of conflict situation. As a lot of people who are listeners know, I do a lot of work with American Indians and or Native Americans. Both are acceptable, but I'm not going to get into all of that political stuff now. But what I am going to say is that one of my favorite things and one of the school's favorite things to do is the Talking Stick Project. Thank you, Linda Driver, for wa- for sticking with us, for watching us today, new listener. Um, And what I want to say is I really think this is an excellent project for parents to do. First, every kid you have can make their own talking stick. And I'm going to pass this on from a teacher who does this. A talking stick in American Indian culture is a a tool for conflict resolution. So only the, the person with the stick is allowed to speak. So you can have family meetings with it. The cool thing is you can make them on your own and decorate them in schools where they do this project. I'll take this hint from a teacher. Like I was saying, she has every kid make a talking stick in the beginning of the year and they put them on the the windowsill and they use a different talking stick every day. And if you talk out of turn, if you interrupt somebody at the time the talking stick is being used your talking stick goes to the end and it's not going to end up being used that month. And that's just, it's just a peaceful consequence because children need consequences. They don't need anger and they don't need violence, but they do need consequences for disrespect. And in, in American Indian culture, they only get consequences for disrespect. So it, the talking stick is a kind of way to recognize everybody's equality at the same time as you're recognizing that there's a reason to sit and talk. And sometimes the reason to sit and talk is just to hang out with the family and get everybody to listen to each other. So the talking stick is great. Making the talking stick, having each child make their own talking stick, having you make your own talking stick. 
so that that everybody's talking stick gets to be seen and gets to be used, which is really fun. It's really great. And it's just it's a great project with a great teaching and a great visual. So hi, Linda Chambers. Thank you for joining us, too. Lots of Lindas, (laughs) as usual. So I'm going to turn it back to Celia for a second here to go on with our our next point, our next pig. (laughs) Okay, so, um, so, you know, patience is vitally important in life. And just really remember what triggers you to be impatient will also trigger your children to be impatient and even more so because as an adult, your brain is fully developed. As a child and as a toddler, your emotions are fully developed, but their self-regulation is not developed at all, and that's where you come in. And if you are unable to regulate yourself, you will never teach them how they regulate themselves, which, of course, brings you to the very important fact that you should be a role model to, to your children and what you want from your children you too should be doing. So let's talk a little bit about positivity. And if any of you know me or follow me, you know I'm all about gratitude. And I believe that gratitude is the key to many people being, to, to people being positive and appreciative. And, you know, you have to be grateful for what's in your life. And when you believe and you really speak about gratitude. If you have a gratitude journal at home where you and your kids can write down what they're grateful for every day, it really starts your day upbeat and positive and happy to like be, you know, do it, having life and doing what you're going to do for the day. Um, Oh, hold on. Maddie wants to talk. Well, I just want to share that, that, and I think in previous broadcasts, we've shared this before, But I just want to share that among the Haudenosaunee, or who we commonly call the Iroquois, they have something called the Thanksgiving Address, which is a list of everything in nature that we have to be grateful for. And they go through it every day. And it's the the wonderful thing about doing something like that is that it takes you outside yourself and it takes you into that place of being grateful for everything in the world that gives up its life for us, that is always in service to us. So the, the nice thing about doing that with your kids is first, nature is wonderful for children, as we all know. And second, it gives them an appreciation of and a recognition of these things, animals, plants, the air we breathe, all this stuff that's provided for us. So while, while it's it should also include the things that you are providing for them so that your children get an appreciation of you and their grandparents and their family and their home. It including nature in that gratitude journal, including nature in if it's your prayers, if it's a meditation, if it's simply something you're working on has a way of expanding their worldview and has a way of giving children a deep understanding of the fact that people and nature are always in service to them. And, and that, that is something to be truly, truly grateful for, even if you're not getting the specific gift you wanted on Christmas. So, I mean, I, I actually think starting Christmas day with a a gratitude um, prayer, a gratitude thought, a gratitude meditation, whatever, whatever it means to you might be a beautiful thing to try. And if you're on with us live, I'd love to know if you do any kind of gratitude journaling in your home, whether it's with you, whether if you have kids, if it's with your kids, or if there's any gratitude journaling going on. And journaling is a great thing to teach your children. Also, positivity has everything to do with the way you speak to your kids and you speak to others. Do you smile? Do you use your manners? Do you use the beautiful words of your language and not the ugly words of your language? Are you doing random acts of kindness? You know, my grandkids lived with me for two years and we used to go around and, you know, we would talk about how to be kind to others. And one day my five-year-old grandson was sitting in the car and we drove past a homeless gentleman 
and he had his dog sitting next to him. And we were actually on our way to Walmart. And Mason, the five-year-old, said to me, Gammon, they call me Gammon, Gammon, can we go to Walmart and can we buy food for that man and his dog? I didn't say anything. He thought of it on his own. And I said, absolutely. And when we were done in Walmart, he found some food for the dog. We bought water. We bought a sub for the gentleman and we gave it to the man. And he was so grateful and so happy. And, you know, you could see a beaming smile on Mason's face. And when you teach kindness to children, it, it spreads and it helps them deal with their world and help them share kindness in their world. So we were watching Ellen DeGeneres this afternoon, her new comedy special on, uh, what's it on? Netflix. So highly recommend it. And it's called Relatable. And she was talking about that, that exact thing, about how we need kindness classes in school. And, and here on, um, on Strong Island Radio, you can watch our beloved friend and sister, Marianne Francisi with Spark Elementary, her kids and she do a live broadcast at two o'clock. And I'm, I'm not just plugging it because we love her, but I'm, I'm also encouraging you to watch it because these are kids talking about topics that are important to them. I think it's called at the principal's table. And it's really, it's really wonderful to listen to her students because they do focus on kindness. They do have kindness classes and compassion classes. And the kids have their, their t-shirt for their school says got kindness. So it's a really good thing to encourage maybe even a club after school. If you're, you know, not fortunate enough to have a school like that in your neighborhood, but certainly starting a kindness club at your kid's school would be something to think about if you want to get proactive in the school. I mean, we do a lot of talk. I am in 120 some odd different schools every day of the school year, many days of the school year, I should say throughout the school year. And I'm in three different states doing programs. And I can tell you that every single school has signs up about character and kindness and being polite, but not every single school carries it out either with their, the, some of their parents or teachers or even the kids themselves. So just writing words on a wall is not the way to get your children and to their friends to be kind. It's, it's really something that's modeled at home. It's wonderful for the schools to do it, but it's really something that has to be done in conjunction with the parents. So I'm going to turn it back to Celia for a second to talk more about that. And at the holidays, guys, this is like the perfect opportunity to be working with your kids and um, teaching them gratitude and kindness. They get so many gifts. And isn't it a wonderful time to discuss the needs of children that don't get the abundance that they do and to really discuss with them different ways that they can share their abundance with kids that may get nothing. And maybe if they have 10 gifts, maybe they can pick out one that they take to a needy family or they take to a homeless shelter, you know, and, and teach them how grateful they are and let them really learn and, and experience the real life of having that gratitude for their abundance when others don't necessarily have that. We don't want to get too preachy here because I'm sure a lot of you are out there doing that kind of stuff right now. I'm, I'm certain of that. And you wouldn't be listening to this kind of program if you, if you weren't concerned with these kinds of things. And I, I will say this, in today's atmosphere, it makes it very difficult. There are a lot of people out there that have a vested interest in keeping us angry, keeping us divided, keeping us focused on all the negative up. So it's a lot to overcome. It's, it's just the culture in general is a lot to deal with right now. But we can. There are wonderful little ways and little things that, that we can do along the way that keep us grounded and keep us grateful and keep us working towards happiness, happiness in our families, happiness for our kids, and ultimately happiness in our community and our country. 
can't say enough about the pursuit of life, liberty, you know, and happiness. <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about being neighborly, because a lot of parents these days have so many fears. They're so fearful. Their kids are going to be taken. They can't walk somewhere. They can't walk around their neighborhood. They can't do this. They can't do that for the fear of it hurting their children or something horrible happening to them. And I really encourage parents to be neighborly, talk to their neighbors, understand the community they live in, go go to their police departments, go to their fire departments, check out a food store. When somebody has a name badge on their shirt, say, thank you, Maria, for serving me. Thank you, George, for serving me. Whatever that person's name is, refer to them by name. You will put a smile on their face ear to ear because no one ever does that. I call anyone that has a name badge by name. I don't care what they're doing. And I always say it's sometimes in the neighborhood, it's a front porch versus a back porch mentality. You know, if you're the type of person that's always on your back porch and you're never seeing who's around you, then that's the type of person that's going to be just kind of hidden in their own little world. But if you're the type of person who sits on your front porch and you see your neighbors and you can wave hello and you can smile and you can talk and you can say, how was your day? And your children see that you get to know each other. You get to support each other. And in the old days, when Maddie and I were growing up and we knew everyone in our neighborhood, that can happen again. It can happen again if you allow yourself to meet and greet people and allow your children to get to know who they're living with and who they're living next door to. Did you want to say something? Oh yeah. I just, I just wanted to say that, that even in the neighborhood I live in now, when I first moved in 21 years ago, there weren't fences up between yards. Everybody knew everybody. Kids ran through the yards that we knew everybody across the street. And of course, as people get older, people move and, and people pass away. And so neighborhoods always change. It's, communities are ever changing. I will say this, the wonderful thing about living in a small town is you get all those small town things going on. You know, you get the parades and you get Santa on the fire truck driving up and down the street and parents still waiting out on street corners to, to pick up their kids from the bus stop and talking. So, so there, there is a real joy to small town life that is more difficult if you happen to be living in a city because certainly a lot of times, I mean, I used to live in a city in an apartment. I, I knew the people across the hall from me, but I didn't, I didn't know anybody else. And actually in a few of my apartment buildings, I didn't know anybody. So it's really, it really is an effort and people are suspicious. And I think sometimes they think you're a little crazy (laughs) if you try to make friends, but I think we can break through all that. And I think it's, it falls into the category of one of those things we have to believe in breaking through. You know, we've talked about that a lot on radical democracy that when, when people say to us, well, you can't, you can't change politics. You can't change the way politicians are. Yes, you can. You can change it. You have to change you first. You have to change the way you think about what you're doing the way you think about who people are. So we try to, to change ourselves from the inside. And Native America is a great, a great way to look at that. I mean, the one thing I always think about that's wonderful with the way Native American children are raised is they're raised with stories. And these stories always have lessons and the lessons are always about respect and behavior and they're fun and they're entertaining. But from the time you're born, you're hearing this and from the time you're born, you're in your community. And we can certainly find ways. I mean, a lot of our schools are open to us to have gatherings and to to have community events. And a lot of communities do that. I mean, I'm not saying that that isn't happening. But if you feel like it isn't happening where you are, it might be a time to for you to get together and start something at your school that brings people together, whatever it may be. And certainly if you have, I, I know I see a lot of diversity in a lot of schools and some, some schools do cultural days and some don't. And I think that when you're in a school that has their, their cultural representation day, their multicultural day, whatever, whatever they're sponsoring, I think bringing that to all schools is 
really, truly wonderful and really, truly goes such a long way to, to help us love each other and be grateful for each other and be grateful that we live in a country where there is that much diversity, where people are respected no matter what. And, you know, education is the key. Teaching kids about, you know, other people, other customs, other ethnicities, teaching and learning and being educated is the key to end a lot of the hatred and the the um, prejudice and the things that we believe exist all around us. And um, so our next P is perseverance. And this is important because you want to keep educating. You want to keep talking about things. You want to keep talking with your kids. You want to allow your kids to talk to you. You want to be consistent in your behavior. If you are, you know, if you have, uh, you have, um, you know, routines in place and systems in place and uh, schedules in place, you want to be consistent with all of that. You don't want to, you know, a lot of kids will, you know, be running around at night and they're, and I have a lot of parents that say, I, I can't get my kids to bed. And a lot of that is because there is no routine for bedtime. The biggest routines you need are morning routines, bedtime routines, after school routines. Those routines have to be in place. And when routines are in place for kids, that's where the peacefulness of parenting comes in mm-hmm. because they know what to expect. They know what to do next. They know what's expected of them. They and and it's key, guys, to let your children contribute to all this. When you create an evening routine, let your children suggest parts of that routine. They know what it is. Okay, we're going to take a bath. What are we going to do next? Your child knows we're going to brush our teeth. We're going to get in our pajamas. Let them be part of creating their routines. You know, when kids are defiant, there are two whole reasons why they are. Number one is for control. And number two is for attention. And the more positive attention you give them, the more you allow them to have control over various aspects of their growing up, the less defiance, the less chaos you will have in parenting. Maddie, Maddie wants to say something. Well, and, and I just want to go back to that, to, to that in, the, in the routine is that story reading at bedtime or storytelling at bedtime. And I also want to suggest a little family project of story writing. You can write lesson stories from with your kids and have them illustrate the book. The, the great thing about lesson stories is you start with the lesson. So it's kind of like writing backwards. You know, you start with the lesson you want to teach sitting with the kids and then go backwards, create characters. It's fun for them. If you take the hint from American Indian storytelling, then you would have, you know, talking animals. You can create a, really get them to use their imaginations, which is another really important thing. And they really are not getting enough of that in school nowadays because, like we've talked about, everybody's so test crazy. And, you know, we've got that one size fits all mentality about education. But you can compensate for that at home. And you can do that with imagination projects. You can do that with storytelling projects with um, having them write and illustrate their own storybook and then read that at night. And that it's a really great thing to do that, to just have the kids. We do this in schools with kids and you can do it, do it with them pretty young, that have them decide on what the lesson is, have them decide on what the characters are and then create the story. You can even do that old, you know, that old game where somebody starts out with, one sentence. We do this all the time with our grandkids. We start out with a sentence and then the next child builds a sentence and the next child builds one and the next child builds one. And with uh, Celia's granddaughter, my grandniece Harper, we we came up with some pretty funny stories (laughs) because of her her fear of bears. And so a lot of when she was young, a lot of these stories that we did had to do with dealing with this fear of bears that she had. 
And it was great. It was great to sit with her. And those were all verbal. That was not anything written down, but it, you can write it down yourself later and then continue to create those. So just a nice family project. And while we're on the topic of storytelling, storytelling is also a great way to get kids to talk about their problems. Mm -hmm. So if there are things going in school, uh, going on in school, bullying or something happened where maybe your child got in trouble and they're hesitant to talk to you about it, storytelling is a great way to get them to open up. And maybe the, and you know, the parent can start the story with, you know, whatever the issue was, or, you know, I heard from a parent that this happened in school. Can you elaborate on it? You know, what, you know, or let's make pretend this is happening and this happened to this little girl, what would have happened? And you can really, you know, get through to your children and really get down to what really happened in some situations through storytelling. It's a great, great tool to use. Um, but don't give up, you know, don't give up and don't, you know, there are times in parenting and parenting is a tough job. Yeah. It's a hard job. And there is, you know, I'm the last one to tell you that as much knowledge as you gain and education you gain and strategies and techniques that you gain from somebody like me or reading books or whatever there will always be an issue that comes up and you lose your patience. And that's okay because that's a great teaching moment to teach your kids that, hey, you know what? After you've screamed at them, you can come back in and say, you know what, guys? I'm sorry. I had a terrible day. I'm feeling a little irritable. I think I need to take a 10 minute time out myself <laughs> and chill out. And I really apologize for reacting that way that, you know, was uncalled for and say your story. You want your children to say your story. Be authentic with your kids. Be honest. Let them know that, believe it or not, your parents are human and we do make mistakes. And mistakes are not things to be afraid of. They're things to help us grow. We learn from our mistakes. We, you know, we, it's, it's a stumbling block of life. And in order to reach success, mistakes have to be made. You know, there are great things that came from mistakes. You know, Thomas Edison, when he invented the light bulb, he made a thousand mistakes inventing the light bulb. And when asked about the mistakes, he said, I didn't make a thousand mistakes. There evidently were a thousand steps in creating the light bulb. And, you know, sticky note glue, sticky note glue was a mistake. They were trying to create a strong adhesive and they created the glue that comes off easily and sticks and unsticks and sticks and unsticks. They didn't know what to do with it for a long time. And then someone thought of the sticky note and the rest is history. They made millions, gazillions, even maybe even millions, lots of money from that mistake. <laughs> so mistake and talk to your children about it. They should not be leery of mistakes and they should not think less of themselves when they make a mistake. A mistake is an opportunity to learn a new way, to learn a new path. If the outcome was not the outcome you needed and you review the way you got there, then you say, you know what? You work with your kids. How can we reach the outcome that you wanted to get? Let's think of a new plan. Let's try this way. Ask your kids, what would you suggest? And put their suggestions into play. When you honor your kids by respecting their opinions, they build self-confidence. They build self-worth. They think, you know, they think highly of themselves and their opinions. When you allow them to make a suggestion, you put that suggestion into play, you are honoring your children and you are building respect. Respect is earned. And you are not just automatically respected because you're the parent of a child. You need to give them respect. They need to give you respect back. So don't give up on them. And unconditionally love your children no matter what. There is nothing my children could ever do that would stop my love for them. My love is unconditional to those children, and they know it. Um, oh, hold on. Pause, please. <laughs> and I hope you guys can tell the difference. Between yeah, I don't know. Sometimes our voices sound a lot alike, especially when we're recording. But so what? We're interchangeable at times. <laughs> So I just wanted to go to go back to that idea 
from Native America, again, where you, their children are not punished for mistakes they're making learning things. And this is tough. It's tough to be up against this in school. I mean, when you've got kids that are constantly tested because this over-testing syndrome that we have, this, when you constantly test a child, basically you're telling them you're never good enough. I have to just keep testing you until you get good enough. And if you listen to the show Marianne did, there's actually, they're doomed to fail on that first test they take in the beginning of the school year because they want to show an improvement by the test they take near the end. So there, there's no way they're passing that first test. They fail. You're saying that, oh, we're doing it to, to benefit the the school, it's, we're doing it to see how the teachers are doing. So, you know, it's not really going to hurt the kids. It hurts the kids. So you're going to, as a parent, you, you just have to write it off. I mean, you have to reinforce the fact that that test is for politicians mostly, but we'll talk about that another time. But um, that those tests don't have anything to do with who they are. And then you can reinforce that, of course, at home with with going with that, I, I can't say enough about that teaching of consequences only for disrespect. If children have boundaries and there are consequences given for being disrespectful, rewards given for being, relate, being, being polite, being respectful, being kind, rewards above and beyond whatever awards you're giving them for their achievements, they're then that reinforces that it you don't want to do the reward thing so much that they're only being kind to be rewarded but you do you do want to make sure i think it it's it's worth looking into out there america to see what it would be like if we just gave those consequences for disrespect and we allowed our children to make mistakes you know our dad is a rocket scientist and I remember one time we had this discussion about this and he said, you know, 80 percent of science is making mistakes. So like Celia said with Thomas Edison and you can find a million examples of this. The trick is to make the mistake and then have the courage to go on. That's where the teaching is. That's it. It's perseverance. Make the mistake, but go on anyway. So that's what we're looking at. And to help you with um, the attitude of the child and consequences and all of that, the key is what you reinforce. So when a child is acting positively, when they are doing a behavior you want, like, you know, a million of my, my parents talk to me about how can I stop my child from whining? How could that's like a huge thing? How can I stop my child from whining? Your children, like I said before, do their behaviors for two reasons, control and attention. And whining is totally for attention. And if you give your child attention for them whining, they will continue to whine. Why? It's working. (laughs) If they whine, they get attention. They don't care if it's positive attention. They don't care if it's negative attention. They've got your attention. You're getting irritable. You're like, stop whining. Your attention has to go to what they're doing right. It's hard to do. I know if they whine all the time, I understand it's hard not to react. But when you really react and you show them attention for the right things they're doing, not the behaviors that are negative, those negative behaviors will slowly change because they are no longer working. It's pretty matter of fact, kids do behaviors to get attention. If you reward that attention and you give it to them when they're doing a negative behavior and you give them lots of attention, they will continue to do it. It's simply what's working and what's not working for them. And if they're doing good, positive behavior, that's where you need to be praising them. If they come up and they talk to you with a smile on their face, you can say, you know what, honey? Wow. I really appreciate the way you spoke to me. Thank you so much. Yes. What can I help you with? But if you're always giving them attention for whining and you give in to everything they want when they whine, they will always whine. The whining will never end. 
and you will not be creating a good citizen. You'll be creating an annoying citizen that none of us want to deal with. So the 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 other thing I uh, that's a great takeaway from the Haudenosaunee is this idea of nonviolent consequences. So we we do an activity with kids where we have where we say to them, so if you could solve the problem of disrespect in school, if you could if you could make the rules of your school, and you could sit with the parents, you could sit with the teachers. What would the rules be? What would you do if somebody was bullying? What would you do if somebody's disrespecting a teacher? You know, and you can you can do that. You can apply that idea to anything you do with your children. You can sit with them and say to them, OK, so here are the unacceptable behaviors as far as me as your your mom and dad. You know, these are not acceptable behaviors. So if you do this, what do you think is fair? And yeah, what are the consequences? And the nice thing about the the approach of the Haudenosaunee is there's no violent consequences. It has to be fair. It has to be wise. It has to be nonviolent. It has to be even though it is a consequence, it has to be respectful of their humanity. So, you know, they, the Haudenosaunee have a four-step process. What happens the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time. And you can create that with your kids. And then maybe even, how about this? Bring it. You should create it with your kids, the ones that are certainly cognitively old enough to do that. But how about bringing that idea into a school, you know, and do what you know, Marianne's kids do, what they do in their private school. But, you know, I, it would be great to get some of these ideas into the public schools. And certainly there are some very wonderful, I was just at one for two days up in Wading River. There are some very wonderful public schools that do this also. But it's it's got to be brought into the school by somebody because it's not in their curriculum. It's not something that they're getting tested on. But as a, so as a parent... You should be doing that. Like I say, kids do things for two reasons, attention and control. And when you start giving them some control over their life, which is what Maddie is speaking about, when you actually say, you know what, I don't want to hear the whining anymore. So what do you think your consequence should be for whining again? Now, consequences, I recently did a broadcast about consequences, and there are certain keys to consequences. I don't want to take up a lot of time with it. But while we're talking about it, you have to make sure the consequence fits the crime. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if your child is on a video game and you say you have 20 minutes to play or better yet, give them the option and say, you can play for 15 more minutes, you can play for 20 more minutes, let them pick even better because that gives them control. But if you say you have 20 minutes to finish this game and 20 minutes comes and you come to end the game and they're like, no, 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 I'm not ending. The convenient thing about video consoles is they unplug and they're very transportable. So unplug that video console and take it away (laughs) and they don't get it back till the next day. And if this happens in a few days, you best believe when time is up 20 minutes, they're going to start ending when you say to end. Now I would not take the video game console away from a week for a week. That just doesn't make sense. That's a little extreme. You want them to learn from what's going on. You don't want it just to be a punishment. The key is to help them learn what they should be doing, how they get to cooperate in the family, and how they understand what's going on, the needs of the family, why maybe they should stop playing video games because they can't play all day long, even though they'd like to. We need to eat dinner. We need to get homework done. There are other things that need their attention. So the punishment should fit the crime. Don't give them some outrageous random punishment that has nothing to do with what they did. It will make no sense. Okay, so um, one more thing from that. (laughs) One more thing. (laughs) It also helps if you have, if you have like really fun days with your kids and and playing. Yes, we are moving on to playing. It also helps if you have an auntie like me who overindulges your kids. But that's another thing is that you know we are, we we are a culture that um, does not have a lot of connection with 
our extended family. And really, that's one of the reasons that parents are so stressed out is that when you have that connection with the extended family, there's there's somebody to take a break. You know, there's somebody to take care of your kids while you take a break. So that's that's another great reason to connect with your community, obviously. But it's also it's also another great reason to look at other cultures and how they operate, because we we are unusual in America. We actually are the odd man out in the world. In most other cultures, there's grandparents living in the house. There's aunties next door. People people live close together so that they can help each other's families out. So um, that's it's an interesting thing to look at. And if you don't have that in your own family, is is there a way to create it? I mean, is there something that the community can do? Something that that you see if you have that need, look around and see what's available to you. I can't speak to that right now, but if there's enough interest, if we see some tech for that, I can. There's some people that I can talk to about what's a, what's available. But it's something to think about creating that extended family with your neighbors if you don't have it within your own family. So let's talk about play and having fun. <laughs> and guys, if you have comments and you're on Facebook, you can type a comment to us. I know you can't call in for this show because we're occupying the phone lines. <laughs> but, you know, having children is supposed to be fun. <laughs> it's supposed to be a good time. So if you're miserable, you need to do something about it because if you're miserable, your children are miserable. How do you have fun? You have fun. You know, I, I know I talk to parents and they're like, well, now that I'm a parent, I can't have fun anymore. You can have fun. You know, yeah, you can't take your kids to a bar and drink or, you know, <laughs> play pool. I guess you can play pool, but, you know, not you can bar. have, not in a bar. Right. So, I mean, you can have fun. I, you know, one thing that was a common element in our family when I was raising my children is that we always had fun. Tell jokes, laugh. If your kids are fighting with each other, I bet if you blast some music and you start dancing in the other room, in five minutes, they're going to stop fighting and they're going to be in there looking at you, number one, because they'll think you're weird. But then in 10 minutes, they're going to be joining you and having a good time and dancing right along with you. Tell jokes around the table, laugh, uh, play outside. We're good, we're good. You know, run around, play tag, play dodgeball, play all those games they want to ban in school, which right. are ridiculous. <laughs> you know, have fun, have balloons, get balloons, guys, balloons. Cheap, cheap, cheap gifts. You can put it in a stocking for a stuffer, stocking for a stuffer, a stocking stuffer. <laughs> Under inflate them, under inflate them. That's my biggest tip because then they won't pop every two seconds. And when it's cold and dreary outside, have a bag of balloons, they will stay inflated. And if you throw 20 balloons out on the floor, even 10, those kids are having a great time. They're bopping them, they're throwing them. You can have tons of fun indoor with balloons. They are a must have for your house, I'm telling you. But have fun. The more fun you have, the more entertained you are by your children, and I'm telling you, they're extremely entertaining, especially teenagers, especially toddlers. They're just plain funny. Let's get real. They're funny. They do funny stuff. Amazing stuff. They'll think you're ridiculous for laughing at them, but it's funny because you know what you were like as a kid. Be authentic with them. Talk to them about what happened. Oh, my gosh, I did this when I was a kid. Let me tell you what happened. It was a disaster. And they'll be like, oh, my gosh, you were a child. I hadn't done that before. <laughs> so, you know, have a good time with your kids. It is key to parenting. Play with them. Go to parks. Climb on the playground with them. Don't just look at them. Go down the slide together. Climb up there. Go through tunnels. Do fun stuff. Lo and behold, you may find and discover your inner child because <laughs> we all have them in us. We all started out as small children. We probably have very strong memories of our childhood. Take advantage of that. Play with your kids and have a good time. Those are where the memories are made. Nobody wants to sit and yell at each other. And that's the, the funny thing now is we have to make, we have to make everything like have a reason. You know, everything has to be justified. It's like we just read this article that it's a good idea 
It's a great idea. I'm not downing the idea. Spread through 32 countries. This, you know, the the run uh, for yeah, a minute. Running. running. Yeah, yeah, running. <laughs> it's like they have kids run in run for 15 minutes every day <laughs> at the beginning of school or in the middle of school or something like this. They just let them outside and let them run around. We used to call that recess. <laughs> the difference is, right, the difference is that when we were running, we were playing tag. So there's other advantages to that. If, you know, if you're playing a game running around, getting your fitness, you're getting socialization, you've got problem solving, you've got creativity, you've got patience, you got to wait your turn, you've got perseverance, you want to make it, to, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things going on with game playing, fun game playing, where the emphasis is not winning. One of the problems that kids face now is that everything they do after school is structured. Everything is a sport or it's got a purpose. Like I said, it's got, it's got to have a result. Get your brain out of that. Get change. If, if that's the way you're thinking, try thinking differently. And maybe you won't have to spend so much money at the gym either because You'll be in shape if you're running around with your kids. Find courses that incorporate parents and kids together. <laughs> if you want to sign up for a program like our Fun Fit Family Fitness Program, our Fun Fit Program incorporates, incorporates kids and parents. They're working out. They're playing games. They're getting exercise together. Do things with your kids. Just don't be... In the stands, just don't be watching them. Participate. They will love it. You will learn from them. They'll learn from you. It's an amazing phenomenon how much fun you can have with your kids if you really try to have fun with your kids. And, and I think, too, the more activities that you can find like that, you know, where, where it's real life, it teaches you those real life lessons, you know, this nonsense about, about, oh, we can't let them play tag, somebody might get hurt. But that never happens in life, right? Nobody ever gets hurt in life. You know, I mean, that's, these are games that prepare you for life. And then I also want to give a pitch for gardening. I have worked with a wonderful gentleman who raises chickens and gardens, and his kids have, have always you know, grown up with that experience. I don't know what your neighborhood's like, and maybe you can't raise chickens like he can, but you can have a small garden, you can have herbs, and especially if you have a child that's really interested in that. This is another thing that I love from Native America. When the when the grandparents were the teachers, you know, the parents were busy keeping everybody alive, so the grandparents were the teachers, and part of our job in teaching was to watch the child grow up, figure out what they were interested in, what moved them, what what were they good at, what could be more than one thing, and then honor that. And then that led to whatever job they were going to have as an adult. So if you're if you're looking for that in your children, if you're looking for what they're interested in, anybody who's successful will tell you that that's how they got that way. They're doing what they've always loved doing. And they're, and we have many things that we love, you know. So, so when you're looking for that in your children, when you're looking for what they are interested in, it could lead to what they will ultimately become, and they'll have success at it. So that's going to improve their self-confidence. So we only have a few minutes left. I'm going to turn it back to Celia. So referring back to gardening, what else is great about gardening is in this society, we have created a huge problem with instant gratification. And kids want things now, and they want it this second. You know, if you're old like us, when the Internet came into existence, yes, we lived prior to the Internet when dinosaurs run the Earth, <laughs> but we had dial-up. So that was that thing when you would, like, call in the number, and eventually the, interrupt, and the Internet would appear 20 minutes later. But now, you know, if you're on Wi-Fi and that thing doesn't pop up in three seconds, you're like, or one second, you're like, whatever, this is taking too long, on to the next thing, you know, and kids are like that too. And what's great about gardening and projects like that 
is it teaches them delayed gratification, which is vitally important to teach your kids. So when you do a model with them and you paint a little and it has to dry and you do things that actually teach delayed gratification, that is a blessing for your kids because they just don't get it a lot these days and everything has to be instant and they have to get it right or they don't have to get it right. Exercise their disappointment muscle. It's the most important muscle in their body. <laughs> Why? Because welcome to life when you have disappointment and they, they will learn to deal with it and they will learn not to throw themselves into a temper tantrum because things didn't go their way. In life, things don't always go your way. So, you know, these are things they can't always be happy. It's impossible, but they can be happy a lot of the time if you really take these things to heart in your parenting. And I know we're running out of time. And I, you know, I want to tell you guys, if you want to learn about more, about, if you want to learn more about Pumped Up Parenting, I would love to have you join our Facebook group, Pumped Up Parenting, oddly with the same same name. <laughs> and you can go to pumpedupparenting.com, all kinds of resources there to help you with your parenting journey. And um, really, guys, love your kids, have fun with your kids. Don't stress out so much. Give them space, give them air, let them breathe, let them contribute to what their choices are. Give them choices when there are negotiables, when there are non negotiables no choices, but there's plenty of negotiables in a child's life. Give them a choice, even if it's as much as you want green pants or blue pants today. <laughs> Let them pick, and you will find cooperation will be stronger than ever. Here is Madeline. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I just want to wish all of our listeners, whether you're live with us or whether you're going to join us later on, very, very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever it is you're celebrating, just celebrate. We have great cause to celebrate in, in this world, in this universe. There's a lot to celebrate a and to we've a lot to be grateful for, a whole lot to be grateful for. So peace, love, rock and roll. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>